I evaluate, I don't know, maybe 30 of these a week. So I can tell you the process, right? I start at your Twitter. I want to see something where you've been engaging in community, you've been holding Twitter spaces, you have great art, you have great engagement. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Nucci. If you don't know who Nucci is, he's the host of The Nucci Show, a podcast about NFTs for collectors and traders. He's also the head of partnerships at Premint, a company that helps NFT projects build allow lists and a following. Nucci, welcome to the show. How you doing? Mike, Mike, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. I'm super excited to have you. There's so much we're going to talk about today. But before we go there, I want to get your backstory. And, and by the way, what we're going to talk about today is like how to actually launch NFTs with collaborations. But before we get into that, I want to hear your story. How the heck did you get into Web3, NFTs, start wherever you want to start? Yeah, I, I think I'll take us back to 2013, which is when I bought my first Bitcoin. Um, I'd noticed I, it in the news and on Reddit a few different times, and it kept catching my attention. And in December of 2013, I bought the top at the time. It was like <clears throat> eight or 900 bucks. And uh, that's, that's a steal, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, it crashed down to like 200. I thought it was the biggest mistake of my life for a while. But um, yeah, it was interesting. It And then it, <clears throat> excuse me. So it was interesting. I, I buy this thing at $1,000, it crashed to 200 and I kind of forget about it for a few years. And then in 2016, I heard a TED talk by a guy named Don Tapscott, and it was all about blockchain and how blockchain was going to revolutionize the world. And it was sort of one of those moments where marketing took a hold of this word blockchain, which in reality is just kind of a slow, uh, a slow, expensive database. And they marketed everything with blockchain. And that led into this like 2017 bull run. And at that point, I was like really back into NFT or back into crypto. Uh, I started getting interested in NFTs at that point. I'd heard about, um, in 2017 at least, I'd heard a guy named Mad Bitcoins. I met him in San Francisco. He was launching a project called Curio Cards. It was one of the first NFT projects. Um, a full set sold at Sotheby's recently for I think over a million dollars. It was a very early NFT project. Wow. But it's still the, the, the bug like still hadn't totally bitten at that point, right? And then we went into a crypto winter, as we always do for a couple of years. And uh, the next time I heard of NFTs was in digital art was through Anthony Pompliano, who was talking about it in his newsletter. And he said, I think digital art and NFTs is going to be this this huge revolution. And, when, and was that, when was that approximately? That was probably 2019 or 2020. It was early. It was okay. early. Um, and I'm reading it and I'm like, okay, interesting. And I, I do some research and I'm already, I've been in crypto for a long time and I can't really find like the front door to NFTs. I can find it to a lot of other things in, in the crypto industry, but NFTs, I'm going to these websites, I'm looking at art and I'm just lost. And I joined a couple discords, I'm still lost. And the big aha moment for me was I was at the gym, I was listening to Kevin Rose's podcast and I, I hear him talk about Proof Collective, which is this thousand person group of artists and collectors and it was an NFT drop. You could mint one of these NFTs um, in a Dutch auction. The Dutch auction started at 5 ETH. And just to show kind of my ineptitude at the time, I minted it at 5 ETH, which now looks, again, I look like a genius, but at the time it ended up selling out at 1 ETH and I spent about $20,000 on something I could have got for 1 ETH. But I get into this group and I'm just amazed. Uh, there's artists, there's collectors, there's devs, there's builders. And I just, I don't even, I'm, I'm like completely immersed. I, I couldn't come up for air. My wife was getting into NFTs. Um, and to be totally honest, I have to give her a lot of credit. Like I was interested in this stuff, couldn't really find the front door. She was already sort of finding good projects and I didn't really understand how she was doing it. She found Azuki, she found Psychedelics Anonymous, projects that did very, very well. And I was clueless to, and she sort of nudged me into the whole world. So I want to give credit where credit's due, but Wait, real we, quick here. So the Proof Collective was your first foray into NFTs or was it your first big foray? Because we're recording this near the end of 2020 and Proof just celebrated their one year anniversary, right? And now, as of today, for people that don't understand Proof and I belong to Proof, um, I paid $50,000 for my Proof for my Proof membership, right? Which is about 40 Ethereum. But was that your first NFT or was that like your first like deep dive into NFTs? So that's what pulled me in. I had bought a Wanderer was my first NFT. Okay. Um, really fun project. Hasn't done particularly well, but it's still near and dear to my heart. And I remember 
the process of buying it on OpenSea and looking at rarity. And it was like a really magical moment for me. It was a big aha moment. I knew I wanted to get more into that world, but that was my first one. Proof was probably my second or third. Um, so and, keep going. You go down the rabbit hole with the proof ecosystem and then what happens? Yeah, I'm in this network of these amazing, I mean, like the top artists, the top builders, the top collectors. And I kind of felt like a schmuck, like sitting on the couch, just reading Discord all day. And I was like, I need to do something. So I started writing because I was learning so much about, you know, how to buy NFTs, how to sell NFTs, how to trade them, how to I, how to identify communities, um, how to use Etherscan, all these things. So I started writing about that stuff. Um, anything that like really pulled me in, I would write an essay about. Um, and then I started a podcast and that also it led me to meeting a lot. And I was basically interviewing artists and collectors from Proof and then anyone else that would talk to me when I first started. Um, and when did you start that show? That I started about one year ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's been fantastic. It's led to, I think starting a podcast is one of those things that it, first off, you know, if it like scratches an itch for you and you get to learn a lot. But it leads to all sorts of interesting opportunities and, and exciting things. That and a little do. side note, I started this show in January of 2020. So you probably started right around the same time that I did. Um, and it, he's 100, you're 100% true. Podcasting is a great way to really get to know a lot of amazing people. And so you started the podcast. Keep going with the story. Yeah, I started the podcast. I had on some great artists, some great builders. Um, so now I've got the writing the podcast and then i meet brendan who's the founder of premium through uh we were doing a a trade through the proof and we start chatting i had him on the podcast i wrote a newsletter about him and then he asked me to help him launch the premium collector pass uh which mm -hmm. was the collector nft that premium launched and then over a bit of time he ended up asking me to come help him out with the the project full time and now i'm full time at premium so um that's kind of how I got sucked into this world was I would say proof was really the front door for me, but admittedly it took me a minute to find the front door of this party. So why don't you explain to people a little bit more about pre-mint for those that aren't, don't know what it is? Cause there's plenty of people that maybe aren't yet in the ecosystem and haven't come across it yet. Yeah, for sure. So pre-mint is a tool that helps uh, NFTs build allow lists and to understand what an allow list is and why projects need to use allow lists, we need to go back in time a little bit to understand what the gas wars were. And the gas wars are basically, uh, if you think about a project launching a thousand NFTs a year ago, even today, that could sell out in a minute, in 30 seconds. And you might have 50,000 people who want to get those thousand NFTs. And unlike online, maybe if you're on Ticketmaster uh, and you happen to get through and get lucky, there is no way to really get lucky. People will spend uh, and basically bribe the Ethereum network and the miners with gas, which is basically the, the fee you pay to cut the line. So if there's 10,000 people, the people who pay the most to kind of think about it as like bribing the door guy at a uh, at a club will get in, right? So to avoid the gas wars, which is basically, if you think about it, it's money just exiting the NFT ecosystem, right? It's money that goes to miners and doesn't come back. Um, and it's basically usually won by the best botters and the, the best coders. Uh, so to avoid that, people started building allow lists, which was basically, okay, we have a thousand spots. Let's get a thousand people who we want in our community. Let's get their addresses, their wallet addresses. Um, and those will be the only people who can mint. So there'll be no gas where you're either on the list or you're not on the list. And these were used strategically to help market the product. People would say, you know, like and retweet my my tweet or my account uh, for my project and you'll have a chance to get on the allow list. And people were doing a lot of like allow list farming where they were just doing that stuff day and night. What Premint does is we allow uh, basically any a project to come on and say, uh, we want uh, to allow people who own a proof pass, right, to sign up for this allow list, and we're going to give them 50 spots. So they might give 500 entries. Premit allows you to pick 50. We allow you to check Ethereum balances, check Discord roles. We can check that you like a Twitter account. So we can create a bunch of eligibility. People can sign up, and then the creator who's running the project can actually go and just say, I want to pick 50 people. Um, that is the basics of what Premit does, is where we help we help projects build allow lists. Yeah, and some of them are raffles, right? I would imagine, or are they not? Are they, I mean, so you give the NFT project the ability to um, kind of identify the best people in the list or to randomize it? Is that generally how it works? Yeah, so typically I, I like to think that most of them are raffles, that most people are doing raffles. Um, you can make it first come first serve. You can make uh, it a raffle. We help you debot because there's a lot of botting in this space. 
um, right. even to enter raffles. But technically speaking, you could take your list offline and pick the people you want to be in your community. Uh, hopefully they're they're going through because you can see people's Twitters and their Discord accounts and their wallets and all that stuff. Right. right. The export we give you. But I hope that people are generally choosing randomly because it's a bit more yeah. bit more fair that way. So um, what do you do for them right now? So what is your role? Right now, I'm, I'm the head of partnerships. So Premint, also, we just acquired a company called Vulcan, and Vulcan does Discord authentication. So I help find projects to bring into Premint. I help find projects to partner with Vulcan and bring Vulcan in-house. Um, so I'm just basically trying to find as many partners within the Web3 ecosystem and bring them into Premint and and find you know meaningful relationships that that we can go forward with. Yeah, and for those that have not purchased lots of NFTs like I have, Premint has kind of become the de facto standard. Uh, Moonbirds obviously use, used it, and um, so many other collections use it just because what I love about it is it, it it will check to make sure they're in the Discord if that's a requirement. It'll check to make sure they're following uh, the account on Twitter, even if they've retweeted a tweet, right? So you can use it very creatively to kind of build, if you will, excitement for your project, which I think is amazing. So um, now what I want to do, and thank you for sharing that story. What I want to do now is there's some people listening right now who are thinking about launching an NFT project, and there are others who are kind of skeptical, right? Maybe they're creators, maybe they're businesses, maybe they're marketers inside of existing businesses. From your angle, because you've seen so much in the last year working inside of pre-mint and analyzing the space and talking to so many different NFT project founders on your show, you know, what's the upside to um, starting an NFT project for those that are maybe on the fence about it? Yeah, for people who are on the fence about it, I think it's first important to kind of clarify a bit around some misunderstandings I see around NFTs. In, in my mind, NFTs are, are just digital assets. And we already own a lot of digital assets, right? I think a lot of people think NFTs are just monkey JPEGs, but they're really, I think, can represent things that we already own. So for example, if you own an Amazon Prime membership, that's sort of, in a weird way, like a digital asset. It's a membership. If you own a movie on Apple TV, that's a digital asset. You can't trade it or do anything with it, but you can watch it and you own it there. Um, if you own a skin in a video game or if you own tokens on a uh, on an app like Clash of Clans, those are all assets, right? And I think we already are using digital assets, but we're like we're not exactly using them in a in the way NFTs use them. And and there's some like very distinct differences between NFTs and kind of these traditional uh, digital assets. Like the traditional digital assets are very siloed, right? You have um, your tokens from Clash of Clans and your Amazon Prime membership. They're in two different worlds, right? They're in two different walled gardens, and Amazon Prime can't really see if you have Clash of Clans tokens, and and they can't really work together in any way. With NFTs, the whole space is interoperable. So a good example of this is about four years ago, five years ago, maybe one of the first NFT projects came out and it was called CryptoKitties. They were these collectible kitten trading cards. What was super interesting was after the, it was a very successful project, there were thousands of these, but what was super interesting about it was um, another project popped up maybe three months later and it was called Crypto Dragons. And the only way to create a dragon was to feed it a kitten and it destroyed the crypto kitty forever right but what's interesting is the crypto dragons had nothing to do with crypto kitties it was created by someone somewhere else i don't even know if it's known who created it but the two projects were completely interoperable because they were both on ethereum huh. so i think that's kind of an interesting point and in kind of just the overall interoperability of building things on ethereum and i think also crypto kitties brings up a couple of interesting other interesting points which is that the this space we're building in is completely permissionless if you want to go build an app in, app in the App Store, you have to get permission. If you want to interact with Amazon's APIs, you have to get permission. If you want to put something on Ethereum, anyone can do it, and they can do it anonymously. So you could be interacting with a, a dApp on Ethereum that was built by a 14-year-old in Fiji, right? And I think that creates a, a really interesting world of possibilities. And, and I think the other important piece, before I move into like some of the key features of an NFT and how businesses can use them, is to think about um, ha like the public nature of this uh, uh, of Ethereum, right? So what we were just talking about with CryptoKitties, like anyone can see CryptoKitties. Anyone can see the tokens. Like we were talking about the Clash of Clans tokens. If you had a token on Ethereum, anyone can see what's in everyone's wallet. And, and I think that that's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, it's a good thing in the sense that 
it allows you to kind of target specific individuals. So for example, we were just talking about with Prement, I can say, I want to give this to people who have a proof pass. Well, anyone can see who has proof passes. Um, so that public nature is just a very, very different um, animal to wrestle with, but it creates a lot of opportunities. Uh, it also, it creates some, it just, it, it's an interesting world of incentives um, when you can see everything. So before we dive into like NFTs and how businesses can use them, I think the other thing to define is that there's like kind of two, broadly two main classifications of NFTs. You can talk about a soulbound token and kind of a traditional NFT. Uh, a soulbound token is one that if it's in your wallet, it can't, it, it can never leave. It just stays with you forever. Kind of a more normal NFT is one that you can trade, you can sell. Um, it can be transferred around. But they are two different things and they're being used in two completely... Soulbound tokens are very are a bit more new um, and they're being used in, in some really interesting ways. Um, so, yeah. Real quick, I would love to um, talk about the different kinds of people that buy NFTs and what their motivations are because I think it's really important for people that are thinking about starting an NFT project to kind of understand these different groups, right? Um, that we've talked about when we were preparing for this interview. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, so a few different groups that are, there's flippers, collectors, builders, um, super fans. Those are kind of the main groups that I think about. Um, and these are definitely different groups you're going to want to market to, right? Um, but if you think about flippers, uh, at their core, this is someone who is really just trying to make a buck off NFTs. They're trying to buy for one price and sell for another. Um, flippers kind of get a bad rep in the NFT ecosystem, but they really represent liquidity and represent efficiencies in the market, right? Um, flippers are actually really important. And a lot of people are like, well, I don't really want flippers in my community. But at the end of the day, uh, they're really important when you launch. And the reason they're important when you launch at least a handful of flippers, right? Is because if you imagine launching a thousand tokens and everyone just keeps your NFT and no one wants to sell it, well, there's not going to be any volume on your project. And volume is what kind of gets you to the leaderboard on OpenSea. It kind of gets people talking about your project. Um, flippers are really good for volume. They're also really good for hype. Um, in these Discord communities, flippers are always talking about the new hottest project, and it's a great way to get your project out there. Um, so, it well, and, I, and by the way, I love this because. I think there's a little bit of a flipper in all of us. Anybody who's intellectually honest that's been in the NFT marketplace long enough is going to probably acknowledge that they've flipped in and out of projects, right? So if you think about it, when you do get on these allow lists um, and you get a really good price and you see the thing just skyrocket, um, there's going to be a temptation to sell it and maybe buy back in, which is exactly what I did with um, Tim Ferriss's um, cock punch project. I got on the list, I bought it at 0.3, I sold it at 1.2 Ethereum, and then I bought a semi-rare one at a half of an Ethereum. And I'm holding long now, right? But that's, maybe he doesn't like the fact that I did that, but that created that volume you were talking about that got the whole press talking about this project, right? Because there was so much activity with this particular project. Yeah, he should he should love that. There's There are people who really don't like flipping, but he should love that. And he did something really smart with his project in that, he could have probably priced that that NFT at about an ETH, but he priced it at 0.25 ETH at mid. And the reason I think that was very smart is because he left some meat on the bone for flippers, basically. So he left a lot of price to be discovered after the launch. If it had been perfectly priced at what the market wanted it at, there wouldn't have been as much volume. There wouldn't have been as much hype. There wouldn't have been as much media. So I know everyone wants to extract every dollar they can from the mint, but the worst thing that can happen is you do a mint and you don't mint out, let's say you have a thousand tokens and only 800 people buy it because you made it too expensive or you barely mint out and then there's no secondary volume. Uh, I think that secondary volume is just really, really important. And the Tim, Tim Ferriss is a really good example. Um, the so second group, yeah, keep going. Yeah, the second group I would think about is collectors. Um, and, and to your point, none of these are mutually exclusive. I think there's people, everyone does a little bit of everything, right? Um, for the most part, there are some people who really are hardcore collectors. They have 6,000 NFTs. There are some people like uh, Cyrus is one of my favorite traders. He owns, at NFT NYC, he owns zero NFTs, but he has traded thousands of times. So um, there are people on both ends of the spectrum, but most people have some overlap. Collectors are just what they sound like. 
these are people who buy NFTs and want to hold them for the mid to long term or maybe even forever. Um, and they're also a really important group of people to understand because they're motivated by very different things than flippers. Flippers, it's really just, can I make a buck? Collectors tend to almost be this nerdier subset of people that can really get into the the traits of a collection and the uh, and the various intricacies behind uh, the community and things like that. And understanding kind of this group of people and what motivates them, I think is really important. For example, like Chromie Squiggles are, if you look at them, if you show them to someone who's not in NFTs, they'll probably chuckle. But if you show them to someone who likes Chromie Squiggles, and these things sell for anywhere from 17 ETH to 1,000 ETH, so tons of money, um, they'll tell you the difference between a perfect spectrum and a full spectrum and a bold and a fuzzy. They know every little detail. They've probably looked at every single one of the 10,000 squiggles. They know when it was launched. They know what a day zero squiggle is, which is one that was minted on the first day the contract was available because it didn't mint out right away. All of these nerdy little facts are, are really important because I, I think they I think getting traits right and understanding how uh, rarity and how traits can can get people really interested in the cl- collection and talking about it. Um, it can do real uh, again do good things for marketing your collection. Um, the th- the third group I want to talk about is is your super fans. Uh, these are kind of the people in your communities who, uh, when I think about a community for like a super fan, I think about Bored Apes or I think about Azukis or Moonbirds. These PFP projects are a really good example of super fans. I mean, Chromie Squiggles have super fans too, but these PFP projects, they tend to have people out there pounding their chest about their project, right? And, uh, these are the people who will promote every win you have and they'll defend any mistake your community makes, right? Um, every community is going to step on a landmine here or there. There's just too many of them in this space. But having those loud voices who come out and defend you and believe in you and who are really active in your Discord or pulling commu- your community together, they are like the 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 backbone of your community, right? You can't really survive without them. So identifying these people and getting people like this in your community is super important. Um, these are the type of people that might even spin off their own community based on on yours. So for example, with uh, CloneX, right? There's CloneX Alpha, which is a completely separate community just dedicated to uh, kind of flipping, right? Within Moonbirds, you have the Dead Bird Society and you have Alpha Birds. There's like a, there's dozens of these, right? Um, but these are really important sub communities because like a community is a huge group, 10,000 people, right? And these sub communities definitely help represent uh, the core community. Um, these are honestly, if you can identify these people, they're the people that are really active in your Discord, providing positive messaging. These are the people you probably want to try to hire, or at least bring on in some part-time sense um, to continue and, and get and, and get feedback from, because they're the ones who have their their ear on the ground and know exactly what's going on. Um, so yeah, that's super fans. Uh, those are like the three big groups as I kind of see them. I've been thinking a lot about. Uh, that there are some other ones, you know, there's builders and there's devs, but as it pertains to community, these are the really important groups to think about um, in my opinion. So we've got flippers who are really important um, at certain points in the collection. Typically, um, they're the ones that come in whenever an announcement comes out or when you're launching, right? These are the ones that are speculative investors, probably is the best way to say it, right? They're trying to make a quick buck. You've got the collectors, which we could almost call investors, right? Because they're in it for a longer term. They're probably planning someday to sell, but at a massive gain, right? Because just like an art collector, they may not hold on to it forever. Um, they might buy it as an investment. And then you've got the super fans like I am, specifically with Moonbirds. I have seven of them, right? I could say I'm a super fan of Kevin Rose and a collector because the reason I have seven is because I hope to sell at least one way down the road to recoup that initial investment. But I, I, I have seven Moonbirds. I've got eight oddities. I've got a proof pass. You know, I've, I, I'm kind of dialed into that ecosystem for sure. So um, I think it's really good for everybody who's thinking about starting an NFT project to understand you might need a little bit of all of these people, right? In order to have a successful project, right? And this is now a transition into collaborations really, right? Which is if we're going to do a collaboration, well, let's back up and define what the heck a collaboration is. What's a collab? And then how do we connect with these various different groups? Yeah, for sure. So a collab is basically, I'm I'm launching a project. I have a thousand NFTs to give out. 
and I'm trying to figure out who to give it to. I'm going to go to Moonbirds, right? And I'm going to say, I've got 100 spots on my allow list for, for Moonbirds. Uh, all you have to do is own a Moonbird. With that, you could go to Premint and basically set up a collab, offer it to Moonbirds. And when the, the person goes in to Moonbirds, they would have to connect their wallet. We would check that they have a Moonbird and they could enter the raffle, right? These are a really interesting way to get your project out. If you think about like the space as a kind of a Venn diagram of, of different groups, there's all these different like kind of echo chambers. You have the CryptoPunks and the Moonbirds and the Apes, and they're all in their own discords and there's some overlap, but you want to hit as much of the space as possible, right? And to do that, you can collab out to each of these communities, maybe 50 to 100 spots. And what would happen is in their announcements in their discord, their mods will come out and say, hey, we have a collab and they'll give the premium link. And that really gets people talking, right? And it's just a way to, to kind of get your project out there to as many communities as possible. Um, it, it's, a, it's a really good way to like kind of get the hype cycle building and people talking about, did they win? Did they not win? It's also really great to get your, like or initially building up your Twitter and your Discord because when people evaluate a project for better or for worse, I'm going to look at your Twitter and see how many followers you have. And I'm also going to see how many followers you have that I follow, right? If I see you have 100,000 followers and it doesn't say I follow any of them, that's a problem because I know you bought all those followers, right? So you want to get organic people following your Twitter and in your Discord. And one of the ways to do that is with these premium raffles because we require you to go in and and you can require someone to like a tweet or follow a Twitter or join a Discord. Um, and all those things kind of help build the hype and and, and get your, your project out there because it's very much a, a war on attention right now, right? It's like which projects can capture attention. So any any tricks you can be using to to kind of get your message far and wide and get people talking about it are going to be really helpful. Okay, so let's think about the flippers and the collectors and the super fans with the understanding that we're going to hopefully um, allocate a portion of our NFT launch, um, maybe 100 out of 10,000 to various different groups. Um, Obviously, it seems like everybody's launching NFT projects, or at least they were, and and they will, obviously, in the future. So how in the world do you make this compelling in such a way to these various groups? And how do you identify the flippers versus the collectors versus the super fans? Let's talk about, like, and this is right in line with, obviously, what your job is, right? How do you identify and how do you really go and develop those relationships in such a way that you'll get... Um, NFT project X to say yes, because I would imagine they say no to probably 95% of the people that are coming to them. Right. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great, it's a great question. So two things, I think starting at the community level is really important, right? So let's start with flippers, for example, the first thing I would do is I would try to identify 10 or maybe even 20 different flipping communities, right? Um, the underground is like one of the top flipping communities or trading communities, uh, Wumbo labs, there's dozens of them, right? I would make a list of those, and then you would want to get in touch with their collab managers, which are the Look, people. Did you say one bow as in B O W? Wumbo, W U M B O. Oh, I'm glad you said that because nobody would ever guess that. <laughs> so in Wumbo Labs, okay. Wumbo Labs, yeah. Um, both of those places have some of the smartest traders around. There's dozens of these communities. So the way this whole process works, it's sort of this like underground uh, exchange, right? And uh, there's always going to be a collab manager for every community. And that's the person who handles these collabs. And that's sort of your gatekeeper, right? You have to get in touch with the collab manager and show them your project and say, hey, we've got 20 spots we'd love to offer you guys. Um, from there, they're going to look at your project. They're going to look at your website. Like I, I evaluate, I don't know, maybe 30 of these a week. So I can tell you the process, right? I start at your Twitter and I see do you have a Twitter presence? Have you been teasing this project or did your Twitter account get opened yesterday and you have one piece of Fiverr art on there, right? I want to see something where you've been engaging in community, you've been holding Twitter spaces, you have great art, you have great engagement, you've been doing some marketing, things like that. Do you have a website, right? Uh, you'd, be some, you'd be shocked at how many projects have a Twitter account and that's it, right? So do you have a website? Does the website look great? Is it a beautiful website? Like, I mean, there are thousands of the tens of thousands of NFT projects, right? Um, you really need to stand out and differentiate yourself and go look at some of the best projects and see what do these websites look like? What are the ones that really stand out? Because if you look at enough of these, it's very easy and about, it's like a muscle muscle memory of like, you, you get to a site and you're like, 
these guys got it. It's, this is a real project. Or if it's one where it's the same cookie cutter project, there's there's teams around the world of people who just rinse and repeat the same exact project over and over and over. And you can definitely start to feel that. So um, yeah, has there been love poured into this project? So look at their Twitter, look at their website. We'll look at their Discord. Um, and yeah, we'll see. What are you doing? Like how how many spots? How many? How big is your project? What is the mint price? These are all things that go into it, right? Are you doing 10,000 pieces at 0.25 ETH? That might've worked, you know, nine months ago, but in almost no world is that going to mint out today unless it's a very, very, very big name, right? Yeah. And even Tim Ferriss only did 5,555, right? And he's got a massive following, right? Yeah. At 0.25. So yeah, mint price, uh, collection size, mint date. Are you three months out? Like you kind of want to time this. I mean, the space moves really, really fast. If you're doing collabs today, your mint should probably be in the next week or two. It probably shouldn't be in the next three months down the road, right? Uh, because by the time, yeah, by the time people, it's actually time to mint, everyone forgot they signed up for it, right? So timing that all out is really important. Um, if you're going to do mint waves, that's another thing that's kind of important is like, you know, your first group, first hour, it might be these three groups and they're all guaranteed a spot and your second wave will be over allocated. But all these things are things that, you know, those collab managers are going to look at. And because, you know, if, you, if you're saying I have a 10,000 piece drop at one ETH, you're going to get laughed out the door, right? So you have to price it correctly. Like I said, you know, you all want to leave a little meat on the bone, right? Like there needs to be a profit to be made, especially if you're talking to flipping communities. Um, and then collector communities, that's, you know, I would be hey, looking real, at- Real quick, before we, we before we flip over to collector communities. Um, yeah. It, pardon the pun there. Um, <laughs> let's talk about- um, identifying collab managers. How hard is it to determine who the heck the collab manager is? Can you just go into a Discord and say, hey, who's the collab manager? I mean, how do you do that? So you can quite literally do that. Uh, okay. <laughs> there's there's a couple ways you can do it. But I would start in, I would start in Discord, right? I okay. go into their Discord and if on the right side, it usually lists the owner of the Discord, the mods, and sometimes the collab manager. And at the very least, you can just say, hey, do you guys have a collab manager who handles collabs? And somebody will respond. Um, you can also, there are people out there who know all the collab managers. And if you you can probably talk to them and and hire them. And one of the things that happens in these collabs is you end up giving, this this might be like a, a dirty little secret of the collab managers, but like oftentimes you'll give the collab manager a guaranteed spot on your project, right? Uh -huh. or, or guaranteed spots. So they might say, hey, we have eight people on our team. They're all volunteers. Can we get eight spots? And it's very normal to give those up. Um, but it's the, but you're not giving it away for free. They still have to pay for the mint, right? Or are you giving it away for free? They still have to They still have to pay for the mint, but they are guaranteed to be on the allow list. Because, yeah, because normally the community might get 20 spots. They'll have 500 people enter. In this situation, they're guaranteed to at least be on the list. Uh, I have seen projects airdrop to collab managers as well. Um, especially some collab managers will get you into 10 different communities or 20 different communities. Uh, so, you know, you want to value these people's time. Like they're, they're doing a lot of work for you and they often are doing it for free and uh, they provide a huge service. So they're sort of uh, the people working behind the scenes to make all this work for sure. You mentioned that there are people that you can hire that do this kind of stuff. If people were searching to hire someone like this, what would they be searching for? That's a that's a great question. I would be looking for people who are very active across the space, uh, either on Twitter. I, I would just start asking, you know, really active people on NFT Twitter. Do you know anyone who would make a great who would be help me? collab this out i'd be looking for active collab managers especially people who collab on multiple communities mm. o oftentimes if you go to someone's twitter they will post i'm a collab manager in clone x alpha and board apes and they'll list three or four different communities they if they have multiple communities that they're managing collabs for they're going to be a great resource for you whether there's someone who can collab out entirely like like to, to every community or at least just somebody who can get you in touch with the right people I know there's a Discord out there of all the collab managers. Um, I can't. That's not open to the public, so they all sort of know each other. And if you can get in touch with a couple of them, they can usually get you in the door with a few other people. Um, cool. And it it looks really good for them to be able to go and say, even if even if I'm not the collab manager for Proof, for example, but I have a great project, I might go to Proof and say, Hey, 
I'm working with this guy. He's, he would love to chat with you guys. He's got 25 spots. Do you guys want to have a conversation? And yeah. more often than not, if the project's super premium, they're going to want to talk to them. And it, it looks really good for for me. And, and it definitely goes back and forth that way. Sometimes they'll bring projects to me. Sometimes I bring projects to them. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, good. So everybody's thanking me for asking me, asking you these detailed questions. I can already sense it. So now <laughs> let's, let's go on to the, uh, we've been talking about flippers, but so much of what we're talking about is applicable, obviously, to the collectors as well. But what do we need to know about collect the collector community when it comes to trying to do collaborations? So it's honestly very, very similar. Um, the only difference is that it's a different group of people. So maybe the way you want to talk to them is a little different and the communities are very different. So if you think about collecting, I would start with like generative art. That's where a lot of the big collectors are. So with generative art, I might be looking at Grailers DAO or GM DAO, um, or even like the people who hang out around FX hash tend to be more collectors, but it's a very different group. Of, it's a diff very different community, but the process works very similarly. The only difference is that they're a little less degenerate, right? They're they're not like a lot of the flipper communities are just looking for a quick flip. These people you might want to change the messaging a bit for, but generally speaking, at least with collabing, the process works very similarly. I would imagine they're going to be a little bit more particular about the artwork, right? If they're more collectors, right? You'd think so, uh, <laughs> but that's not true. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, no, collectors definitely can be particular, but I would say. Collector, like you said earlier, if we're going to be honest, collectors are also flippers. Like they can be mercenaries just like the flipper. The flippers, in my mind, are just a little more hardcore. And I've seen them, they'll buy 20 NFTs at 0 0.02 and flip them all for 0 0.03 and make 0 0.18, you know, and that's their day. And that's a great day for them. Whereas collectors are probably looking for one nice trade here or there, or they might hold your NFT for longer, um, which is great. But generally speaking, the collab process works very similarly, whether you're working with a, uh, um, a collector community or an alpha community. Um, but the key here is you just want to find as many unique kind of pockets within the NFT space as possible, right? For example, if you're going to offer something to Proof and Moonbirds, that's a big overlap on the Venn diagram, right? right. If you're going to do Proof and Moonbirds and Oddities, again, big overlap, right? Um, even Proof and Punks, right? There's going to be a decent overlap there. But if you go... Uh, to like Salat, uh, maybe Salat is a bad example, but if you go to like Sup Ducks, right, and you go to Moonbirds, like those are two completely different worlds. Um, and or if you go into like even Grailers DAO, that's like a deep generative art space, uh, and versus Mutant Apes, right? Those are two different worlds. Like you want to hit as many different worlds that don't have overlap as possible with this whole process. What about the super fans? Um, I would imagine people can only be super fans of so many projects, right? And this might be a really hard group to kind of attract, right? Yeah, totally. It's kind of a little bit like if you just take 100 random fans from a baseball team, right? You're going to have a couple that turn out to be super fans. How you find those people initially is is an interesting challenge, right? So I think Moonbirds did a really good job at this, right? Because they, I don't believe they collabed out their project. They just had an open raffle. But you had to have 2.5 ETH in your wallet, or maybe 2 ETH. So it's enough where it couldn't really be botted. But for a lot of people, winning that Moonbird was like winning the lottery. It was the it was their big it is their only blue chip because they were able to win this one raffle and mint this thing for 2.5. And I think they did a really good job of finding a ton of super fans because they didn't go to people who already had an ape, right? Sure, some people already had an ape had it, but they did a public raffle, right? So this wasn't one that was geared towards a specific community, it was just, hey. Here's 8,000 spots for the public. Anyone can join. You have to have 2.5 ETH in your wallet. That's a really important thing to, to put in there. Uh, it's a, an eligibility requirement because if you if you were to say, you know, anyone can join and there's no Ethereum requirement in your wallet, your, your raffle is probably going to get botted and you'll end up with 50,000 entries and 40,000 of them will be from the same, you know, 10 people. So... Yeah, for Moonbirds, it was like, this is my thing. This is the thing I won. This is my my big, my blue chip. And then from there, like that was the community, obviously the one they they fell into and that they became super fans in. Um, but also like a little bit of super fans is like engaging them, keeping a community happy, constant that which is totally different than collabing. But that's post mint, you know, doing interesting and exciting and fun and, and hypey things. And there's a million different ways to do that, whether it's through airdrops or staking or burning mechanisms. Um, 
And those are all all very interesting ways to keep your community engaged and, and incentivize various behaviors. Okay, so first of all, this has been super exciting to talk about these different groups and and really the concept of co- collaborations and kind of the secret sauce as far as how, how it all works. I want to talk now about what D Gods has done that you think is really exciting. And for those that don't know what D Gods is, full disclosure, I happen to own a D God. I got one when the market crashed. Um, and Frank is quote unquote his name. Uh, he's been doxxed, but that's the name everybody knows him as. Is the founder of D Gods. So what is it about what they're doing? It's a Solana-based NFT that you can buy on Magic Eaton. What is it about what they're doing that you think has been really interesting that we can learn from? Yeah, so I kind of just mentioned a little bit of this about uh, staking and and burning NFTs and airdropping NFTs. And these are all really interesting mechanisms that are very unique to NFTs uh, that allow uh, a project or business to to connect and drive engagement with their community in the long run. DGODs have done three very interesting things. Um, there's some there's some like things in NFTs you just can't do. You can't tell people to sweep your floor, which is basically saying, I have a thousand NFTs, someone go buy the cheapest listed one, right? It's just not a good look. You're gonna get you're gonna get in a lot of trouble if you like it's gonna be a PR nightmare if you say sweep my floor, right? But the way DGODs did it is they created a token called Dust. And they basically said, if you buy the floor NFT, you will get extra dust. And dust, I don't know what it's at right now, but for a while it was at a, a dollar or two, and you could make four to five hundred dollars of dust just by buying the floor D God. So they basically found a way to say, hey, sweep our floor, and you'll and you'll earn some money. They also another thing you can't really do is you can't tell people to delist their NFT, right? Projects used to do this. They'd say, hey, can you can you unlist your NFT? Because we want our floor to go up and we want people to think we, we're a, a high value project. Um, basically, any project that has a staking mechanism is telling their community to delist, right? Whether it's Moonbirds, their nest, or, or, or back to D-Gods, they have a, basically, if you stake your D-God, you earn dust. So you you earn, I don't know, maybe 12 dust a day and uh, or, or 20, I can't remember what it was, but it, it keeps changing and it keeps going less and less. It's kind of, mimicking the Bitcoin supply model. But again, they found another way to uh, to basically get people to keep their D-Gods off the marketplaces. The third thing they did with Dust is they drove engagement on Twitter. And Twitter is really the epicenter of conversation, at least public conversation for these communities. So if, they can, if you can get your community to be on Twitter and be loud on Twitter, which is basically what the Bored Apes did to become the biggest blue chip project in the space, they, they came up with Ape Follow Ape. It might, it might not have been original to them, but they certainly took it to a new level. Um, anyone who is on Twitter and anywhere near the crypto space knows that when Bored Apes were kind of maybe a year ago, you couldn't hide from them. They were so loud. They were having so much fun. Everyone was following each other. They all had 5,000 followers. They were all having fun and, and everyone knew the apes were having fun and that you were if you weren't in, you were out and you, you could feel it, right? So what Frank did over at D-Gods is they said, you know, when you buy your D-God, uh, put the tweet on our site and we're going to track who in our community likes and retweets it and they can win dust. So if you ever put that tweet out there, uh, I, I don't know if you did that when you got yours. I did. I, but I, 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 I just put a picture out there and I said I purchased it and I tagged them and put a hashtag not knowing what I was doing because I do that whenever I buy a new, new project. And um, they retweeted it and I got hundreds of comments, you know, from people saying all sorts of weird things you know but so are you saying that they're actually incentivized to to do that is that what you're saying yeah they are so they're tracking who does that and they're giving dust to those people and and it just it's very interesting to me because like these are all tools at a creator's disposal you you have a lot of different mechanisms right so in that case we just discussed basically staking um and what else is he doing and and a token right He, he has this token that you can earn and and they're incentivizing the community with their token, probably better than any other community I've seen. Like ApeCoin exists, but they're not really doing any of these shenanigans. Um, but you know, you can also do things like burning, which D Gods doesn't do, but I think it's really interesting. And I think someone who did it recently that that kind of nailed it was Xcopy. He had an addition. Xcopy is a, a and probably one of the earliest NFT artists in the space. He is the the top of the pyramid. He's the king. He's his stuff goes for millions and and sells on Sotheby's and 
But he also has more affordable stuff as edition pieces, maybe one of 100, one of 200. Um, and one of his one of 200 pieces, I think, it's called Afterburner. He said, if you own one of these, you can burn it and you can get, you might be able to get something called a Trader or a Green Afterburner. And they were like these, these rarer pieces that he was creating. And he said, and if you have two of these Afterburners, you can burn two of them and you can get this piece. And if you have three of them, and he created this burn mechanism. And just for anyone listening who doesn't know what the word burn means, you're basically sending your NFT to a contract where it can never come out of again. It's basically gone forever. It's the same thing as literally burning a painting, right? So I think it's really interesting because what he did with that was as soon as he announced this, that collection saw crazy volume because people wanted it for this burn, this whole burn mechanism, right? And with that volume, obviously came royalties. Great for him. But what was really interesting is like, let's say I own an afterburner. You're giving me both the option to go get new art, but you're also giving me the option to hold something that I know the supply is going to go down on. So I know that the value of this thing is going to go up. And the value did go up right away and the value went up long-term as well. But it was just a very interesting mechanism on how to engage his community, how to introduce new art, how to reward his community because the prices all went up, how to reward himself. It was it was a, a really... It was a really brilliant execution. It's something I think Moonbirds is trying to uh, to tackle a little bit with uh, with the Mythics coming out. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Um, they're going to allow anybody who has an oddity to burn the oddity to get a Mythic, um, which the whole concept of you just paid like one point whatever Ethereum, which is well over $1,000 or something, and you can destroy it to get something else that you hope will be more valuable. It's just really kind of, uh strange you know uh, short of a uh, ripping a ticket when you come through a gate and knowing the ticket is worthless because you're now into the stadium or something like that you know but you're you're not buying a ticket in this case you're buying something and you're saying i'm just going to go ahead and destroy it with the hope that this next thing is going to be more valuable it is a really fascinating concept isn't it yeah and and with oddities what's i've been speculating quite a bit about that is you know are they pegging this new collection to Oddity. So the new collection is called Mythics. There's going to be 20,000 of them. They'll be dropped to Moonbird holder, airdrop to Moonbird holders. And um, airdropping is basically the idea that when you have someone who owns your NFT, you know who owns it. So I can just send you a new NFT. So they're just going to airdrop these new NFTs to their existing. But they're going to very slowly drop them in like sets of 250, right? Right. They're uh, 25. And oh, that, 25. Wow. yeah, that is an idea that they... I believe they borrowed from Nouns, which right. Nouns is another blue chip. They release one NFT a day. It's a very interesting self-sustaining project where they basically set up this machine that's going to continue to drive hype over time, right? A lot of projects are worried about what their next announcement is. With Nouns, they have an announcement every day. There's one new NFT. The supply is super small. Um, the community is super tight. It has a lot of... I mean, Nouns is one of the most premium communities in the space, right? So I think Moonbird stole a little bit from the burning and a little bit from the from nouns, right? And uh, not not stealing, just borrowing. These are all great ideas, and you want to put them together in these these novel ways, right? But what's what's so interesting to me about the oddities thing is you're incentivized to burn bad oddities, right? There's good oddities, there's oddities with more desirable traits, and then there's bad oddities. So I imagine the bad oddities are going to get burnt, and the good oddities, I imagine there might be two or three thousand left after this. I assume multi-year process, and those it should become a very small collection of really, really high quality oddities. So I think that the oddities that are rare will do well over the next few years. Um, and I'm also very interested to see, you know, oddities today exist. They have a price. I don't know what it is. Let's say it's an ETH. I know it was floating around there for a long time. Mythics don't have a price. They're new. They're coming out. The market has to decide what they're worth. But it's very interesting for me to see, like, have they pegged the price of Mythics to oddities ahead of time, right? Because they've already said this is worth one, like, if you sell one oddity, you get one Mythic. So it'll be interesting to see if, like, they've sort of already created a market for it. But, um, yeah, just a really interesting experiment, a great way to keep your community engaged over the long run. I'm, I'm excited to watch it unfold. Well, folks, there you have it. We went down some fascinating little rabbit trails. We talked about collabs. We talked about D gods. We talked about some of the fascinating d game theory, almost, you know, with some of these NFT projects. And hopefully, you've been given a lot of new ideas. Uh, Nucci, if people want to uh, check out your podcast, where do they find it? And spell Nucci for those that are listening. 
And then also, if they want to connect with you or check out a website or whatever, where do you want to send them? Yeah. First, I just want to say thank you. Um, like huge fan of your show. And I think you're doing like really great work here and yeah. spreading really, really great information for people. So I applaud the service you're providing. Um, I, my, my name is Nucci, N-O-O-C-H-I-E. Uh, my podcast is called The Nucci Show. It's all about NFTs. Uh, and I'm on Twitter at a simple Nucci. And my website- Wait, wait. A simple Nucci, is that what it is on Twitter? Yeah, yeah, I went a little quick there. Uh, like A simple yep. Nucci. I, I tried to get Nucci, but somebody claimed it about three months before I got on Twitter. Ah, uh, okay, cool. <laughs> Do you have a website you want to send them to? Yeah, my website is Nucci.xyz. And if you want to shoot me an email, my email is Nucci.business at gmail.com. Nucci, thank you so much for, um, I mean, I could talk to you for another hour because there's so much to this fascinating stuff. Folks, check out his podcast, connect with him. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. We're so much better because of it. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it.